praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Can we please humble ourselves and we pray? Father, we want to thank you, Almighty God, everlasting King. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. For all that you do and what you shall continue to do, Father, we say thank you. For your glory, power, your goodness, your greatness, and your love, we say thank you. For your loving kindness, King of glory, we say thank you. Father, as we go into your word, give us revelation and understanding. We bind and cast out anything contrary that wants to take up your place in this afternoon in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that we shall not only be hearers of your word. We'll be doers of your word and your name will be glorified. Father, take all the glory, take all the praise, take all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Praise the Lord. Uh, as we are learning our last day series, looking at the last days, we are still looking at the book of Exodus. So today we are looking at um, Exodus 24. Remember we had said that we are not going by chapter by chapter, verse by verse like we did for the book of Daniel and Revelations. We are only picking about those chapters that are very crucial for us in the last days that we are going to learn from. So this uh, Exodus 24 is uh, generally talking about meeting with God. It's more about meeting with God, meeting with God. And when you look at Exodus 24 from verse 1 to 2, Exodus 24 from verse 1 to 2, let us go to Exodus chapter 24, verse 1 to 2. Exodus 24, verse 1 to to two. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar, and Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord. You and Aaron, come up to the Lord. So God invites Moses, Aaron, and his two eldest sons, together with the 70 elders of Israel, to meet with him. However, only Moses is invited to come near to God. So the purpose of the invitation was to confirm God's covenant with Israel. And that's why it's very important. You go to a man or woman of God, they tell you this and that. You go back and confirm. Go back and confirm whether it is God because when God is involved, he comes in and gives the details and gives everything in detail the way it's supposed to be. So they went back to get the covenant that God had promised Israel. Now, looking at uh, that Exodus 24 verse 1 to 2, we now next go to Exodus chapter 24 verse 9 to 11. We now go to verse 9 to 11. Let's go to verse 9 to 11. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of seraphic stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now, they saw God. It was a form. It was a form. A form, you know, a form that came that they saw, not seeing him, but they saw the form of him. And, you know, he can come in any form as God. So the elders were allowed to see only God's footstool. He only, they could see only God's footstool. And this is what Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 23 tells us. And the Amplified Version brings it out more clearer. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 26, the Amplified Version, it says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a seraphic stone, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man. Now you see here, and there was under his feet, and it were paved work of a seraphic stone. So they only saw the footstool of God. He did not lay his hand. Um, the ancient word, the ancient world believes that to see God would be death, to bring death. You can also see that in Judges 13 verse 22, in Judges 13 verse 22. Because it was God who invited them in Luke chapter 10 verse 22, uh, because it was God who invited them, we also see this in Luke 
10:22 and no one knows who the son is except the father and who the father is except the son and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him it is our lord jesus christ who wills to reveal to whom he wants to reveal who he is and who the father is so they drank and ate with god in the ancient biblical world covenants were normally concluded with a special covenant meal so it signifies that they are now allies they are friends they have become a family they have become one they're in agreement that's why they had to eat and drink they close it up with eating and drinking so it also conveys an acceptance it declares an approval of those with whom one dined with or ate together with and jesus also dined here with the tax collectors when you look at it in matthew chapter 9 from verse 10 to 11 let's see matthew 9 matthew chapter 9 Matthew chapter 9, let's see Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to, unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? So you see, for him to dine, he's trying to say, I have no, no enmity with you. I have no enmity with you. But him dining with them did not mean that he's going to do the things they are doing or follow their ways. No, he stood his ground as Lord and Savior. So we continue. Remember, we said we are not going in the chronological order, but you know now we are in Exodus 24. The other time we read from verse uh, 9 to 11, now we are going to read verse 12, 13, and then we shall skip verse 14 and read from verse 15 to 18. So we are still in under Exodus 24. Exodus 24, we are going to read verse 12 and 13, and then we shall also read verse 8, 15 to 18. We shall skip the verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. Verse 13. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Verse 15. Then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it seven, six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud, went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So why did he wait for six days? Why did he wait for six days? He waited for the six days to prepare to enter the glory of God. When you're going to get into the glory of God, you have to prepare. When you're going to seek God and you have this faith that you're going to meet with him, you have to prepare. When you're preparing to go on a, on a spree that you're going to seek the face of God, you have to prepare. So why such preparations are needed? Why are such preparations needed? Let's go to Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33. Let's go to Isaiah 33 and we shall read verse 14b. Isaiah 33 shall read from verse 14b to verse 17. From verse 14b to verse 17, b is the last end of the verse 14 of Isaiah 33. So we read, Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Those are questions. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of the oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refuses bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king of his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Very clear qualities of those that will see God. Very clear. The one who walks righteously speaks uprightly, despises the gain of oppressions, uh, who gestures with his hands, 
refuses bribes, who stops ears from hearing of bloodshed, who shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bed, bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. His eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off, meaning they have a future ahead. So when you look at how all these things happen, Moses waited on God. Moses waited on God. The purpose of his waiting for God was to prepare for the glory that was coming. So what Moses waited on God, that was a spiritual discipline he practiced regularly. It was something that had become his lifestyle. It was something that had become part of him. And he practiced it regularly. So Moses learned this very much and made it part of his life. It was part of his life that he learned from it. And one of the arts perfected in the prophet's life is waiting on God. When we wait on God, we want to hear from God, seeking to hear from him and uh, give out time from our busy schedules to go in his presence. This is what Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 says. It says, I'll stand my watch and I'll set myself on the rampart and watch to see what, we'll see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. He says, I will wait and see to answer what he will say unto me when I am corrected corrected. So I will stand. In uh, Hebrew, the word I will stand means amad, which means to stand. I will set myself. The Hebrew word for set myself is yatsab. Yatsab, which means to present oneself. It says I will watch. It's safa. Safa means to wait, to lean forward, to, to peer into the distance, to observe. I said to see. The Hebrew word is Ra, Ra means rise, R-A, an apostrophe, and then A-H, to see, to gaze, to have visions. So he's saying, what will he say? When you present yourself and wait for God, he will come to speak to you and show you things concerning what to prophesy, what to send out to the people, what to speak. So when you now look at this word that I'll stand I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. He will present himself, you present yourself unto God, waiting to hear, observe, and to see what he's going to show you, what he's going to reveal to you, and the things that you will hear. So when you look at the definition of waiting on God, definition of waiting of God is... Um, Daman. Daman means to stand still, to stand still. This is Psalms 46 verse 10. Psalms 46 verse 10, to stand still. Dumia, Dumia means to wait in silence. So Dumia means to wait in silence. Uh, Daman means to stand still. And when you look at uh, Psalms 46 verse 10, Psalms 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Wait in silence. This is what the psalmist says in Psalm 62 verse 1. I will wait in silence before the Lord. Then uh, kava, kava means gather together. Oneness, bring together. Oneness, that is Genesis chapter 1 verse 9. So when we see chaka, chaka is, um, all this means to wait on God, but it's coming in different dimensions, different scriptures. Chaka means to wait uh, honestly with loving anticipation. Psalms 130 verse 6. And you know the psalmist is the one that really brought all this out because he was so much into waiting before God. He was so much in the presence of God. He spent more time in pondering and meditating upon the word of God, upon the goodness of God, upon the wonders of God. No wonder the Bible says he's the apple of God's eye. He spent quality time. And the Bible tells us that David did not go to war without inquiring of the Lord, meaning it was an attachment and had the heart of God in him. And he made sure that there's nothing he did out of God's presence or God's approval or God being involved in all that he wanted to do. So when we look at uh, the word Sabbath, the Sabbath means cease from other activities before the Lord. Cease from other activities before the Lord. This is Psalm 62 verse 5. Psalm 62 verse 5. To wait on God is to wait honestly in silence. Stillness in God's presence. So seeking to be bound in a perfect union of intimate bonding with the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this in um, John 15. Uh, 
John chapter 15, verse 5 and 7. Let's go to that. We also have it in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But we shall read uh, the Gospel of John. We shall read John 15. John chapter 15. And we shall read verse 5. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So when we go to verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. It's all about bonding, intimate relationship, coming together. Very, very important for us. Very, very crucial for us. So when we get into the secret place to wait on God, this is what uh, Habakkuk 2.1 says. Um, Habakkuk 2.1 says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and I will answer when I am corrected. So getting into the secret place to wait on God, Moses, when you look at it uh, in Exodus 33 verse 21, the Bible was telling Moses to come to a place that God has secured for him. God has a place that he has secured for each one of us. So there is that place we have to go to and meet. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. There is that particular place that you have to reach where God will meet with you, where God will talk with you, where God will you know, answer all the questions that you have. Jesus climbed a mountain. Why did he climb a mountain? A secluded place, a quiet place where there are no distractions, where there are no interferences, where there are no interruptions. When he goes into seeking God, he's in a quiet mode that he can hear clearly from the Father. Jesus' counsel to the revelators, to the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and him with me. So him knocking at the door. You can only hear the knock when your spiritual ears are open. You can only hear the knock when you are alert. You can hear the knock, the knock when there is silence. But when there is a lot of noise banging, you might not be in position to hear the knock. So we have to train our spiritual ears to hear. And this is where we have to keep praying. Oh Lord, I pray that you open my spiritual ears. Open my spiritual ears that I will hear your voice, that I'll hear when you're speaking. Holy Spirit, help me. Anything that is in my spiritual ears that needs to be cleaned out, Holy Spirit, help me clean it out. It's very important for our spiritual ears to be clean so that we can hear what the Lord is saying. And then now when you look at it, the heart attitude while waiting before God, it's very important. As you have gone to the secret place, what is the heart attitude? We have humility. We go before him in humility. Isaiah 57 verse 15, in humility. Let us see what Isaiah 57 says. We go to him in humility. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Isaiah 57 verse 15. It says, For thus says the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So we need to have that humility when we go before him. It is one of the requirements that is needed when we are waiting before God. We have uh, loving longings. Loving longings. Uh, this is what um, Psalms 27. Let's go to Psalms 27. Psalms 27, Psalms 27, loving longings, uh, Psalms 27, and we shall read verse 2. Psalms 27, verse 2. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So that expectation, waiting unto him, seeing him, you are sure that when they come, it's not you that will see. It is his presence that will be seen. And where the presence of God is, mountains are moved. Mountains are shaken. Things are shifted. That is how your enemies will bow. Holiness. Holiness. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. For without holiness, we shall not see God. Holiness. 
very crucial thing while waiting before God. And this is where now you go before God. You say, God, I come before you. All those things that have been standing on your way, the eyes of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You begin to go into the heart where you have thought wrongly, imagined wrongly. The hands, if they have gone into touching things that are wrong, Father, forgive me of the sin of the hand. My eyes that went to look and see things that are not worthy of you. My ears that I allowed to hear things that are not acceptable before you. That is the quality repentance we have to keep doing. That's the quality of repentance we have to keep doing. Now, what are the results of waiting on God? What are the results of waiting on God? Remember, our entire theme of the Exodus 24 is meeting with God. So what are the results on waiting on God? Isaiah 40 verse 31. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, when you look at the results on waiting on God, all answers are here in Isaiah 40 verse 31. They are one, two, three, four, and let's see five. You know, there are four of them. Now we see them. He shall strength shall be renewed. What does it mean for the strength to be renewed? Uh, Psalms 92 verse 10. He says he will anoint us with fresh oil and prolong our days, you know. Now that Psalms 92 verse 10, anointing us with fresh oil. Very important. The oil of yesterday cannot fight the battles of today. So we need a daily renewal of fresh oil. Then it says the wings like an eagle. Here it's talking about the spiritual experiences, moving from one realm of glory to another, getting into the deeper realms, getting into advanced realms, shooting and catapulting into higher heights of the realm of the spirit. Wings like an eagle, getting into high spiritual experience that he's talking about. Then he shall run and not be weary. Shall run and not be weary. You receive direction. You don't get tired. You receive direction. Let us go to Acts of Apostles. Acts of Apostles. Acts of Apostles chapter 26. Verse 19. Acts of Apostles 26. Acts of Apostles 26 verse 19. Acts of Apostles 26, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. So you're not weary. You don't get tired. And at that point, you're receiving directions. You're receiving visions and revelations on the task on what to do. You're not worn out. You walk and not faint. You walk and not faint. You walk upon the word. You, you, you stand by the word of God. You're led by the word of God. The word is from God. All that you do, you know you're having that backup from God. And you stand by the scriptures, confident with the scriptures. Let us go to Isaiah 40. Let's go to Isaiah 40. And we shall read verse 29. Isaiah 40, verse 29. Isaiah 40, verse 29. Isaiah 40, verse 29 says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. So each time we seek him, we go before him. And when we wait upon him, we are patient, going by his pace. What happens? He says he will give us strength. He will increase his strength upon us. Then what other result do we get? We are transformed. Transfigured. That is Mark 9 to, to, to 7. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We are transformed into his image, into his person. His presence comes and takes over us, rules over us. And that's when we are changed. And you find that we are actually displaying his person, his character, his nature. So Exodus 24 verse 18. Exodus 24 verse 18. Exodus 24 verse 18. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. He was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. What is that? A spiritual mystery. A spiritual mystery. Now, where is that mystery? In uh, verse 20, in verse 13 of the same chapter, Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Joshua went up to the mountain together with Moses. So when Moses waited on God for 40 days and 40 nights, so was Joshua also waiting. You know, lawyer diligently. Joshua was Moses' faithful assistant. He was his servant, 
faithful assistant servant. That's what Joshua chapter 1 verse 1 makes us to understand. He was very obedient. He loved to linger in God's presence like Moses did. Eventually, Joshua was chosen as Moses' successor. He was chosen as Moses' successor. We see that in Numbers 27 from verse 18 to 23 and also Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. How come when you are faithful in another man's ministry, the blessings of God come, everything that the heavens are set begins to locate you. And that's why when Moses was leaving, Joshua had the capacity to follow the crowds because he was very diligent and loyal. This is something that is so lacking in our generation today. Everyone wants to be on their own. And they want, everyone wants to be above by themselves. When you try to mentor them, they feel maybe you're making them a servant or you're making them low. They have this desire that they must be above at the top. And that's why we see them many try to rise and then they go down. Or you find they are not going beyond a certain level. They are stagnant. They're not going to look at their attitude that is the problem. They're not going to look at their approach to things as the problem. They are going to say, somebody is sketching me, somebody is using my virtual, somebody is using this, all those crap, funny crap. People have not discovered who they are. They have not given time to seek God. They've not given time to know God. They've not given time to search for him. The best they can do is blabber about, talk about. And you see the problem is coming. And this is so sad. Each time I think of it, it saddens my heart. And also releases some, you know, bit of fear. Why am I saying some bit of fear is we have very many believers out saying they are for Christ. They are Jesus is Lord. They are living Christ as Lord and Savior. But they are not ready for what is coming. They are not prepared for what is coming. They have not been groomed for what is coming. They are not being trained for what is coming. Their mindset is switched on about themselves, themselves. Beloved, there is nobody who can use your divine purpose because it is divine. What God has set for Benita is different from what God has set for you, what God has set for the other. If I am to get yours and use it when the heaven is saying, Benita, you are supposed to use A. Where are you using formula C and D? I will fail. If you try to use another person, you will fail. That is something of the demonic world. And beloved, they never last for long. They end up in poverty and frustration. But one cannot be seeking God, fasting, searching for God, dealing with the flesh, cutting out the world, seeking him like never before. God is lifting them up. Then you, you're seated. You're not praying. You're not fasting. You're not seeking him. You're not dealing with self. You now say they are using your glory. That is sincerely confusion and rubbish at its peak. So let us learn to understand. My purpose is not your purpose. My task is not your task. The Bible says he will give us what we can handle according to the grace he has granted unto each one of us. So if my grace is assigned for a particular task, you have not even tried an inch of your own. You're saying another is taking. It is very unfortunate. And all this is the deception of the devil to divert the minds of the people, to bring confusion to the people, to confuse the people and tear the church. Tear the church.